Good morning. Welcome to the Labor Day Sunday holiday weekend. Good to have you all here. Not the uh, most beautiful day out there yet today, but that's okay. It is God's day and we are here to worship and I'm glad you could all make it. Uh, Let's make sure we have uh, announcements covered here today. Anybody have anything they need to share over here? Or over here? He gave Kevin a great workout. He walked over from there to get the microphone. Didn't even need to do that. Well, I'll share a couple things. Um, First of all, so next Sunday, we're going to start or sort of resume our adult Sunday school class at 9 o'clock. We had done in the last, um, during Lent, We had done uh, the book of Revelation, the first three chapters. We're gonna continue now starting with chapter four and try to make our way through that book. An interesting book as you all know, and don't worry if you didn't go to the first first three chapters, you can come and learn a lot, I'm sure. So we're gonna start that with chapter four of Revelation starting next Sunday at nine o'clock in the conference room. Again, it's something you can join us on Zoom for, because we'll be doing it live like we do worship here. So um, we are again hosting a table at the uh, Lighthouse Vocational Services Annual Banquet. Lighthouse is one of the mission ministries that we support here. That banquet is going to be uh, Thursday evening, September the 12th in two weeks at Shady Maple. We get to hear from Lighthouse and get updated on how things are going, what they've been doing the past year, get to meet some of the new staff that they have. And they also have a guest speaker who is Chris Heisey. Chris Heisey is a local gentleman who played uh, Major League Baseball. He's gonna be sharing a little bit about his own testimony and uh, connection with Lighthouse. So if you're interested in being at our table, we have a few openings there, the foundation Uh, takes care of that table cost. It's a way for us to uh, donate to Lighthouse as well. So if you have any interest in attending that, please see me. First come, first serve kind of deal. It's a free thing also, by the way. So Um, speaking of eating and free food and all that, there are refreshments afterwards. They are free. Uh, we want to thank Mary Ann and Lila for providing their, and Jim, I'm sure you had something to do with this, maybe. But uh, there's a nice spread out there, and Marianne already said there's plenty of extra crumb cake, so she already brought like baggies if you want to take some with you. So not only is it free while you're out there, you get to freely take more home with you. It's not even Shady Maple rules where you're not allowed to take doggy bags. We're allowing the doggy bags. So make sure you stick around afterwards and enjoy not only the refreshments, but most importantly, actually, the, the fellowship together that we have after, after church. So um, also want to remind you, and we did have this in an email, and it's out on Facebook and otherwise, we are still working to try to fill our administrative assistant position. We've changed it around a little bit. Um, so if you know anyone who would like to look into that position with us, we would be very open to you letting us, sending them our way. So uh, it is a position that's fairly flexible with the hours. It's looking for somebody who's got some uh, computer savvy with uh, Word and PowerPoint and Excel and those programs. Um, and uh, if, if you know somebody would like to do that, please have them see myself or Kevin. Uh, so, all right. We're bringing those things here before us to remind us what we have as a church, what God's doing amongst us. Most importantly, right now, God is here in our midst to receive our worship and to give to us his word. So let's prepare our hearts to be in God's presence as we come before him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come this morning, we do so very mindful that we are your children, blessed especially this weekend with the rich blessings of your labor among us in your love shown in Jesus Christ. 
And you have called us to be part of your labor in this world of harvest, a world needy of the love of Christ. And we have been given by your spirit the resources to share that love. We come because we've received it. We come to worship you. May your presence be felt. In the name of the Lord, we come. Amen. I invite you to rise and let's sing our first hymn with you servants of God. It's hymn number 112, actually hymn number 112 in your hymnals, but uh, all the words are up front. We come worshiping grateful for God's infinite love. We need that love because when we're on our own, we're typically catching ourselves loving ourselves or not loving at all, not being faithful in the ways God has equipped us to be. But our God is a God whose infinite love still invites us to come to him, to confess to him, and receive from him again the assurance of forgiveness, grace and mercy. So let's take a moment and bow our hearts to God in confession, in prayer. Let's pray. We are your servants, O oh Lord, but even more so, we are your children. You are God, our Lord, our King, but more so, you are our Heavenly Father, our parent. You continue to love us through the thick and the thin of a life that we live, often countering you. Like adolescents who think we know better than you, we live a life trying to show you up, trying to show you that we know 
trying to show you maybe that you're old-fashioned and outdated. And so we veer off in our own way, but you're ready to receive us each time we turn back. We turn back, Lord, confessing our ways, confessing our pride, our self-centeredness, our decisions to not look beyond ourselves at where you would have us see your needs, your calling, your attention. Receive our confessions, our sins, our guilt, our shame. You are our Heavenly Father, and we come in need as your children. Hear our prayers. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. In that name of the Lord Jesus, I can declare for us assuredly from the cross and empty tomb of Christ that God indeed, as our Heavenly Father, forgives. God indeed extends grace and mercy and says, let's go again. May you go again today and always alive in the blessedness of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Remind each other of what they have, who they are, with the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Share that with one another. As we have brought before us on our behalf these tithes and offerings and gifts this morning, O Lord, as we have entered your gates and your presence with these gifts and offerings, we lift them up to you, asking, Lord, that you would receive them, that you would bless it all so that your glory and your name might be known here, there, wherever we are, wherever we go. Wherever we are sent or sent others in your name, may they be equipped and blessed to let your light shine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to turn to Philip and invite his uh, special music this morning to speak to us and remind us of, again, our King who is leading us on as we hear this too.
Thank you, Phil. Good resounding tune to remind us of the one who is leading us, the king that we have, the one who knows where we need to be. So I'm going to invite uh, Finn and Lila and Kenzie, if she'd like to come up. I see you over the pew there, Kenzie. <laughs> come on up. Join me. All right. Lila also has flowers on her dress, too. You have your flower, Kenzie, and your ladybug, and you have your Adidas. That works. All right. So this is Labor Day weekend. Labor Day, you kind of think about not working, although you think about work that people do. That's what labor means, doesn't it? To work. And if you work really hard, you get dirty sometimes, right? And then you got to go home and work really hard to clean up. How hard do you guys work to get clean? Do you work hard at that, Lila? Not really? Well, look, let me see. Let me see your fingernails, how they look. Everybody's clean. Finn, how are your fingernails? They look pretty decent. Kenzie, fingernails. Do you have polish on your fingernails? Ah, yeah. Well, you know, we spend a lot of time getting cleaned up. Showers, baths, washing our hands, all that stuff. People want you to be clean, right? Moms, dads, they want you to look clean. They don't want you to come to church dirty. You know, nobody wants that. But you know what? We spend all that time getting cleaned up after we work hard or play hard. And it is important to be clean. But Jesus talks about something else. Because even in Jesus' day, people got all worked up about how clean they were. And he said, you know what? You get all clean, but what really matters is what's on the inside. God isn't looking at our dirty hands, but he is looking at our dirty hearts. He says it's not what goes on on the outside of the body, it's what's going on in the inside of the heart that really matters. There are some people that could be really dirty with dirt and grime, but they could be some of the nicest people in the world. And there could be people that are very clean and proper and look really good, dressed up very nicely, but they could be some really mean people, can't they? Jesus says it's, he uses an interesting, maybe you won't quite get this, but he uses an interesting little story or parable. No, just a little comparison. He says people are kind of like, a cemetery where you clean up the tombstone and make the tombstone look really nice and shiny, but you're still forgetting that under the tombstone, somebody is dead. They're rotting. It's dirty down there. So he said people are like that. They clean themselves up to look good for everybody. They do really, they, they say nice things or they look all prim and proper, but in their hearts, they're not happy. They're mean. They treat people meanly. So he says, before you worry about getting your hands clean and your face clean and your body clean and your clothing clean, think about making sure inside you're clean. Talk to God about the things that make you angry. Talk to God about the ways that you might feel like you want to say a mean thing or do a mean thing. Straighten out what's inside, because that's where the bad stuff comes from, when our hearts aren't close to Jesus, OK? So work at that too. Work at what's going on inside with God. Let him love you and let that love come out. And that'll help you be clean for him. Okay? Ken's is leaving. And that's okay. All right? You guys will go to shortly too. So let us pray together. Gracious God, we know that you work on our hearts. You work on our insides. You have loved us in ways that sometimes don't always show up on the outside, but they're in there. I pray that our children here might always know they are loved by you. No matter how dirty their hands might be, or their face might be, or their clothing might be, let them know inside they are loved. And may you work on that inside so that love might come out for others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you're going to go with Miss Dina and learn more about that lean heart, okay? Thanks for coming up. 
And I'm going to invite Ed to come on up. Oh, there's Ed. I thought I saw you somewhere. And he is going to share with us our passage today. And we just have one, and it's been the one you've been looking at maybe throughout the week on your emails. Uh, but uh, our passage from James chapter 1. Thanks, Ed. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 17 to 27. Every generous, generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for, you are, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all the sordidness and rank growth and wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save our souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers. You deceive, you deceive themselves. For if any, for if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they saw. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Here ends the scripture for this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So I want to um, talk about what Nike talks about. Just do it. So here we are this Labor Day weekend, and labor, we, we talk about I mean, the origin of Labor Day goes back to the 1800s when the union started, and it was a way to start talking about work through the union and the value of all that, and it's kind of dribbled over the years down to a holiday to remind us to take a little rest, rest from, our, uh, from our labors and from our work, but to remember the work and the labor that we do. With that in mind, I want to look at this passage from James, just a portion of it. I mean, James, the whole book of James is worth reading. There's all sorts of amazing words of wisdom and challenges in that, pa in that, uh, in that letter. And also in this passage that Ed just read, I'm going to take a portion of it. I'm going to concentrate here on this part, verses 22 uh, through 25. But, and, and I'm helping us out here by underlining, highlighting some words. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. So I want to talk today about our work, our doing, our actions from a faith perspective. Now, this should be easy to resonate with us because we are a people who live in a culture that really values work. We are all a product here in America of the what we call the Protestant work ethic. We find work having a very high value. We come from a people who connected that to their religion. 
that uh, to be a Protestant also meant that you were living out your faith and, and, and work, working it out and seeing that all of your work is somehow connected to your faith, that's important to us. Add to that, that for the most part, most of us sitting here somehow, some, in some way or another, have a little Pennsylvania Dutch stock in us. So we're all used to just knowing that work is important. But beyond our heritage, beyond the Protestant thing or the Pennsylvania Dutch thing, we live in a society that uses our work as part of our identity. So think about going anywhere where you're going to meet somebody for the first time. And you want to introduce yourself and get to meet them. There are three things you are always going to ask. What's your name? Where are you from? And what do you do? What do you do? It's part of our very identity. That's what it's come to in, in our own culture and our own society. I laugh at a story that uh, is told by uh, Tony Campola, who's a, was a, still is, I mean, a, a well-known uh, professor at Eastern College and theologian and, and used to be very big in youth ministry work. Um, and he likes to tell it like it is. And so he tells this story of a time where he and his wife attended this very sophisticated party that he had to go to for his work as a professor. And uh, he didn't want to be there. He didn't like going to this stuff. But he's there. And uh, one of his uh, sociology professor colleagues, a, a, a woman comes walking up to them and starts chit-chatting. And um, she turns to his wife, who at that time, uh, Tony's wife was named Peggy, and she was not work. She was a housewife. She was raising their two children. And, uh, and yet she, according to Campola, is the most articulate person he's ever met in his life. Well, this professor colleague turns to Peggy and says in a rather condescending way, and what do you do, my dear? And Peggy, without missing a beat or batting an eye, said in response to her, <clears throat> she said, um, I am socializing two homo sapiens into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might be the instrument for the transformation of the social order into the kind of eschatological utopia that God willed from the beginning of creation. And then she said to the professor, and what do you do? The professor kind of humbly heed and hauled around and said, I, I, I uh, teach sociology. It's part of our identity, part of our identity. We know because we've experienced it through times in life, perhaps through health crisis mainly, but mainly may, also maybe through times in which you were laid off or retired. That feeling of not knowing what to do. That feeling of anxiety or depression because you're not doing what you've always done. One of the things that's become very clear to me when I interact with hospice patients as they're looking at end of life issues, the thing that comes up time and time again is the depression they've been experiencing as their bodies have come into decline, primarily the depression being related to, I no longer can do what I used to do. And so their next statement usually is, as it was to a woman I just met this Friday, why is the Lord leaving me here? Why isn't he taking me? Because... I can no longer do what I used to do. It's a big part of us to work, to do, to be about things. A couple years ago in New York Times, somebody put out a, a, 
an opinion piece where they said, if you live in America in the 21st century, you've probably had to listen to a lot of people tell you how busy they are. It's become the default response when you ask anyone how they're doing. Busy, so busy, crazy busy. Obviously your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you are so busy, completely booked, in demand every hour of the day. That's kind of how we express our value to each other. We remind each other as we remind ourselves that we are busy. We have things to do. We can't find enough time in the day. Interesting, maybe a little side note, but a fun side note. This is not how people thought things were going to be about 50 years ago, 60 years ago. In 1965, it was taken so seriously that the United States Senate actually had emergency meetings and appointed a subcommittee so that they could plan, all right, a subcommittee to plan for the 20 hour work week that advances in technology we would be making a reality by the year 2000. That's what they thought in 1965. And, and, Summer camps, which were thriving at that time, which were very, and they still do today, but back then they were really thriving. Summer camps held emergency board meetings to decide how they would stay open year round to accommodate all the free time that American public was soon gonna have at their hands. Not anywhere close, is it? Technology hasn't advanced our opportunities for rest, it's actually created more opportunities to work, to be busy, to be active. We need to be doing something so we're not feeling like we're nothing. That's what it's come to. Oh, we value leisure. We value our entertainment. We highly value and pay big money for our vacations. But then when we're done with our vacations, we need a vacation from our vacation because our vacations were so busy with so much stuff that we crammed in there. Now, James, Jesus, Scripture, also talks a lot about doing. I don't want to add more work to us. Instead, I want us to recognize what God considers to be valuable doing. We're to put effort. Because we put a lot of effort into stuff when it comes down to it unnecessarily. But Jesus, for instance, makes very clear that as we follow him, we are to be doing things. He says, whoever does the least of the commandments and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. Jesus says, basically, that it's one thing to say you know the commands, you know my wisdom, you know my teachings, but if you're not doing them, there's a problem. It's like the man who wanted to visit the Holy Lands and he's trying to talk his wife into spending the money to go over to Israel and see the Holy Lands. And he says, I want to go and stand on the mountain where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. To which his wife replied with a snort and said, huh, why don't you just save the money and stay home and practice them? We can know the commandments we can know the Beatitudes, we can know the Sermon on the Mount, we can know the teachings of Jesus, we can know our theology of our church, we can know that stuff, but if we're not doing it, it means nothing, according to Jesus, 
according to scripture, according to our faith. In fact, in the Old Testament, in the, in the Hebrew language, which the Old Testament was written in, the word know and the word do, knowing and doing, are not distinguishable. They're the same word. So that if you know, you do. And if you do, you know. So that means if you say you know the commandments, or you say you know Jesus' word, or you say you know God's word, or you say you know your faith, but you're not doing it, you don't know it. You really don't know it. We know this exchange. You probably all remember this exchange Jesus had with a lawyer who came up to him and said, teacher, what must I do? There's that do again. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. Do it. Love God, love your neighbor. Just do it. That lawyer spoke for all of us when he next spoke to Jesus. Because he asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? Notice what he was doing? Trying to get it out of doing it. Well, hey, before I go to all this effort, who should I be doing this to? And then Jesus gave him the story of the Good Samaritan. And he ended that story, that parable, by saying, go and do likewise. The man asked, who's my neighbor? And Jesus didn't really answer. Because he said, basically, it doesn't matter who the neighbor is. Just do the love. Do it. When Matthew has Jesus concluding his teachings, he does so in chapter 25 of Matthew, where Jesus gives the kind of parable story of the king who's going to, at the end of time, take his kingdom and he's going to separate everyone like you separate sheep and goats. And he's going to separate them on his right and his left. And the ones on the right are going to enter the kingdom with him and the ones on the left are going to be dismissed. And he says the ones on the right are the ones who clothe the naked, fed the hungry, gave something to drink to the thirsty, visited the prisoner, tended to the sick. The ones coming into the kingdom of God are the ones who are doing it, not the ones who know it, not the ones who read about it, not the ones who study it, not the ones who discuss it, not the ones who debate it, not the ones who, who think they figured it out. Those are all good things, but they mean nothing if you're not doing it. For me, ever since I was a young kid who got his first, well, it wasn't my first, but intentionally I wanted it, my first little New Testament Bible. Remember, we bought it at the Provident Bookstore in Park City when I was, I don't know, 12. I wanted this Bible. And I went home and I started to read this New Testament. And I only got six chapters in until I was deathly frightened because I read this verse, which has stuck with me for many years since. Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Anybody can say, Lord, Lord. Even demons in scripture say, Lord, Lord. They know Jesus. Those who are going to do the will of the Father. So we do. Our Christian faith developed from doing. The whole Christian faith, Christianity itself, is about a God who spoke everything into existence 
It's his word that created the, the light. It's his word that created the vegetation. It's his word that, gave, gave, that, that created man out of the ground. God spoke and it happened. But then we're told that God, in order to save all of us from our sin, that God took his word and put flesh on it. Gave it life. Gave it a body to live. Christianity is about taking words and thoughts and theories and ideas and putting life to them, putting deed to them. Otherwise, they're just wasted. The doing is that doing that is obedience to Jesus' one and only commandment to love. That is our doing. Learning about love doesn't mean living lovingly. It's the action that shows it. I need to preach this sermon to myself often. It is easy for any of us, but I'll just talk about me for a moment. It is easy for me to get very uh, comfortable in reading about my faith, in preaching about my faith, in teaching our faith, in discussing it and debating it and conversing over it, and not always doing it. In preparing sermons, and thinking, man, I'm getting a lot out of this. But am I living it? I'm going to share three little instances with you. And I don't know if I've shared these before, but I might have. At, a for, at my former church, things were going very well. Things were happening. I was having classes on discipleship and, and people were responding to teaching and preaching and coming to church and very, very excited, growing in their faith, growing in their understanding. But somehow I was feeling like personally and in the people around me, I was, just wasn't sure we were doing anything. And it had come to this, this climax for me one day where I just was by myself during the week sitting in our fellowship hall which we had newly built sitting at a table and just praying God what are you what am I to do am I really doing what you want me to do and I had gotten actually tearful which doesn't happen but I remember it after a bit I lifted my head up and coming into the fellowship down, hall, down the corridor, having come through doors that I did not hear open, comes a young man. And he comes walking into me, to the room to me. And he begins to give me a story, kind of story I've heard often as a pastor from people walking into your church in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day, they have a story and they want some help. And his story was similar to many. I'm going from point A to point B. My wife slash girlfriend is in the car with me. We need to get to point B as soon as possible, but we don't have enough money for gas and the turnpike toll. Can you help me? And in my mind, I've heard this many times. I've actually watched and experienced as people have taken advantage of this. This is probably not true, but then, I hear, what did you just ask me? To show you what to do. And here's something to do. I reached in my pocket, I had 20 bucks and I gave it to them. Was it prudent? Was it, was it wise? Would you say it was a good thing? Probably no, it wasn't. Probably I just enabled another person but that isn't what God was talking to me about. God was talking to me about living love. 
someone approached me with a need, whether it was a real need or not, that's not mine to determine at that moment. At that moment, mine was to determine, what do I do in love? I had another instance where I was working on a sermon late one Saturday night, like 11 o'clock at night, which is unusual because I'm usually working on them at 5 o'clock on a Sunday morning. So this was an exceptional evening. And we were living in a house out on 897 and uh, about six miles from my church. And it's 11 o'clock at night and it is pouring outside. It is storming outside. And someone knocks on our door. I go to the door and there's a young woman drenched. Clearly she had been walking down 897 from somewhere, I forget where. But I guess if our light was on, we're right on the road, she knocks. She says, I need to get home. I live about five miles down the road. Can you help me? I knew where she lived. It was on my way to my church, so I was familiar with it. But this is some woman. I'm gonna drive myself. She's drenched, it's storming, and I know nothing. All very true, all very wise. What were you just working on? A sermon? A sermon on what? Loving a stranger? Duh. Was it prudent? Was it wise for me to get my car keys, tell my wife I'm taking this young woman down the road to her house? No. But that isn't what God was talking to me about. God was talking to me about doing the loving thing. And I did with no drama, no problems, I dropped her off, end of the case. I shared that story the next morning in my sermon. Not many people said anything on the way out, but one lady said to me, you know, there's gypsies in the area. And then there was this Friday night. Now I was exceptionally good because I was working on my sermon on a Friday night. And I was walking downstairs to get something and looked out our front door and I thought I saw red lights flashing. Opened the door and sure enough, there's an ambulance backing down the driveway that we share with two other homes. And it stopped at the first home. So I went outside, I noticed there's a police car there as well. Went in and told my wife, hey, ambulance is here for so-and-so. Now we know our neighbors, but we don't, we don't do much with our neighbors. We don't have like a, that neighbor anyway, we don't have a close relationship with. But back in my house, I started to work on my sermon. This sermon, the one about doing something. And I realized I need to do something. And all that I did was go outside. The police officer was there. I said, is there anything I can do to help them? Do they need help in the midst of what could be a crisis here? He just made me aware that it wasn't really a crisis. Things were kind of okay. Everything was all right. I was fine. But again, it was easy for me to just act like, hey, I don't really know them that well. I don't want to get involved. But hey, there's a police car and an ambulance sitting in my driveway. Maybe I'm supposed to do something. Woody Allen said 80% of success is showing up. Just doing it. When 10 lepers came to Jesus for healing, they approached Jesus. He didn't do anything magical. He didn't say anything. They weren't even healed. He said to them, go show yourselves to the priest, which is what most lepers had to do when they thought that they were, they were done, that the leprosy, the illness had gone away. They were to show themselves to the priest who would give them their next instructions on how to exist in society. They came to Jesus, and Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. On the way, the passage says, on the way they were healed. They were healed when they did something. Healing, transformation, change. Life happens as we do it. Not as we think about it, not as we talk about it, not as we read about it, not as we study about it, not as we hear some guy talking about it. For how many minutes now? Probably 25 or so, folks. Too long. 
how long, doesn't matter. Because if I'm not doing it and you're not doing it, it doesn't matter. We are a people as Christians who do the love. Let me close with one more little story about Mary Martin, actress, most known, I think, for a lot of things, but I think South Pacific was her big thing, and this is a scene from South Pacific. Before she was going on one evening for her performance in South Pacific, she received a telegram from Oscar Hammerstein who was one of the writers of South Pacific and many other Broadway musicals. He was on his deathbed. And this is what his letter said. Dear Mary, a bell is not a bell till you ring it. A song is not a song till you sing it. Love in your heart is not put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. Our faith is not faith until we live it. And living it now, doing it now, not thinking about it, not considering it, not waiting until I'm this or I'm that, but doing what God puts in front of you to do. Maybe think about it in this way. If you had an hour to live and you could make one phone call, who would you call? What would you say? And then my next question to me and you would be, why are you waiting? If it's that important, is that, that meaningful of an expression of love, what are you waiting for to do it? Every day God gives us opportunities to love. Why are we waiting? Why are we walking away? Why are we sufficing with study, talk, preaching, reading, discussing, debating. Just do it. Do the love that God has put in our hearts in Jesus to do. Whatever that might look like. A knock on the door, an ambulance down the driveway, a guy standing in front of you. If you're asking God to live this faith, he's going to give you a chance to do it. Let's pray. Lord, at this time where we do think about our work and our labors and maybe how much and too much that we do, even in, even in our employment or in our retirement or our school, wherever it is, we know we are a people who are caught up in all that we do. But Lord, let us be able to sift it all out and recognize that who we are is ultimately your children, your servants, as we sang and as we prayed earlier. And as your children, we have, we have you to answer to. As your servants, we have you to answer to. And you have given us, equipped us with a spiritual DNA, with, a, with resources and a calling to keep the commandment of love that you've shown to us demonstrated to us, lived out for us in Jesus. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't miss that as a church and as individuals. Let us not become comfortable in theory and in thought and in lessons without taking it all into practice. Keep our hearts and minds and eyes and ears open to where and how we can love this day and coming days. You have moved us, even in the midst of our struggles and our hardships, our pains and our griefs. Each of us comes today from whatever we've been through the last couple days, last few hours. Whatever we might have on our mind is ahead after this holiday is over, or even the holiday itself. We get bombarded with all this, but again, help us to sort it out, to come down to you, holding us through it all and using us to continue to glorify you with the love that you assure us we have in Christ. We have been worshiping you, continue to receive our worship. You have opened our hearts you find them fertile ground for you to continue to plant the seed and grow the seed of the work of Christ in and through us. 
We ask this, we pray this, and we do so all in Jesus' name. As we pray together what he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O oh God, in whom all life begins, that's our final hymn. Let's rise and sing it together. the words that we say, the words that Jesus has said, go and live the life that God has given you in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> 